Herzlich willkommen, meine Damen und Herren. Mein Name ist Lukas und ich komme aus Polen. Ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch, aber es ist genug, einen Kebab zu bestellen, nicht solche Präsentation zu machen. So, let me switch to English. My name is Lukas Kosinski. Uh, I'm the CEO of Size Studio, QML Consulting Company. Uh, we help our customers achieve their objectives by providing them with right cute developers. Um, back in September, I was in Munich for some other event, and uh, there was a talk by Nikolai Ucities. I was there with a colleague, he brought me there, and I was uh, listening, at, and at some moments, I thought, um, I was feeling like a dwarf. I mean, uh, I have a huge respect to you. Uh, you are a group of uh, great minds. You do scientific stuff. You do um, uh, quantum computing. I'm not as smart as Johannes, but I have my niche. I have something that I feel comfortable with, and that's QML and Qt framework. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, yeah, and it's an example that uh, you can be good at something and you can go to Lucas with the Lucas with the long hair, not me, and 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 suggest um, and suggest a topic for uh, one of the next uh, events. So uh, maybe just to warm up you a bit, I wanted to ask just also to know the audience who uh, used Qt in the past so far. Okay who uses Qt framework on a daily basis, okay? And who does it, but using QML? Okay, okay, so that's more or less uh, what I thought. Uh, the, um, one of you guys, uh, uh, we have been talking before, and, um, and one of you did not know what QML was, and uh, yeah, and probably some of you are experienced guys. So this talk is going to be more or less a mix of what you have to know. And then we will show some serious stuff. Uh, so uh, quickly about myself, uh, I'm, I have a background as software engineer, but um, at some point um, I was just doing some more freelance. I started hiring people. Uh, now I have uh, more than 10 good developers. In my team, we do mostly Qt, uh, QML consulting and trainings uh, on various platforms, desktop, mobile, uh, embedded, actually everything that can be done using Qt framework, we do that. Uh, also around Linux and uh, plain C++. Um, but I'm not actively coding right now. Uh, sometimes I'm trying to help and then my guys tell me to just focus on something else. I hope that it's not because I'm bad, but they just want me to do something more uh, effective for the company. Um, I have been entitled with a uh, cute champion title by the cute company for the stuff that I do for the cute community. Uh, but I'm not like a cute fanboy. Uh, I see it's disadvantages. However, this talk is going to be quite positive uh, uh, about cute. Uh, we can uh, uh, we can just um, talk in cool words uh, about its disadvantages, uh, including uh, aggressive uh, sales policy. Uh, so the agenda of the talk, it's going to be constructed of four elements. The first is going to be uh, about uh, why you should integrate QML and C++. Uh, and we are going to talk about uh, some of the basics. Uh, it's going to be for those who are not that familiar with the Qt as the framework and uh, moreover QML. Then the easiest, the most simple way of uh, connecting C++ and QML is by exposing C++ objects to QML, which means by making uh, C++ uh, objects visible in QML. Uh, then registering C++ classes as QML types to allow you use your C++ classes in the same way as you would do that with any other QML type. And then we are going to talk more about drawing custom QML items from C++ because that's the case. Uh, that's a popular case for serious projects. I estimated the talk to take more or less uh, 45 minutes, but to be honest, I didn't check that before. 
Uh, I put 45 minutes here because uh, that's what uh, Lucas put in the agenda on meetup.com. <laughs> so, so yeah, firstly, um, just all of you probably know Qt uh, for being a GUI framework. And that's true. Uh, it uh, was uh, firstly released back in the 90s. And at the beginning, there was Qt widget module. Um, it may look kind of old, and I still think that it's applicable for a lot of cases, but um, it's great for desktops and for native looking uh, applications, mostly. Um, it's not uh, the case for all the projects. It, of course, it depends. And there were some problems with Qt widgets. The problems with Qt widgets were cumbersome customizations, uh, difficulty to uh, implement uh, animations and more advanced styling, um, the fact that they may seem old without proper styling, and also they were, as Qt wanted to get more developers, uh, they wanted to be open for like web and uh, JavaScript guys, um, Qt widgets were kind of difficult for people with no C++ or Python, as Qt is also has bindings to uh, to Python. Uh, yeah, it was problem problematic for those people. Uh, and Qt widgets were um, programmed mostly using um, some generator and, and C++ programming language. So those were the problems with Qt widgets. And the answer uh, for all those problems were Qt Quick. It's like kind of an answer for uh, the needs of modern user interfaces that are often more like touchable ones. And with Qt Quick, you can develop a UI that may look like this. And uh, well, that's my personal opinion. I have uh, tried uh, the other frameworks like Flutter or React Native or some JavaScript ones for UI programming. And there is nothing so natural and so uh, comfortable in use um, as a uh, SQML. Uh, sometimes I may uh, say Qt Quick and QML uh, like meaning the same, but there, there is a huge difference. Qt Quick is the actual module that makes all of the things happen, and QML is a programming language. Programming language that looks like this. It's like a very dummy example uh, of um, of the of the custom item that I just put here, uh, it has kind of a JSON JavaScript syntax. Uh, it's an example of de declarative programming. So we rather put what we want to achieve rather than specifying how we want to achieve this. And well, I wrote a blog uh, post on compar comparing Qt Quick and Qt Widget. So I'm not going to compare them here. Uh, because we have other stuff to talk about. Uh, why would you like to mix QML and C++? Well, mostly, that's my opinion, that QML uh, is a separate language. And at some point, there was a like, kind of a tendency to code everything in QML. But to my mind, for several reasons, there is um, it makes more sense to treat QML just like a front end for C++ application. So one of the one of the reasons to, to mix C++ and QML is the fact that not all of the uh, Qt framework modules are available in QML in, in the same sense. So you still need to use uh, C++, C++ to implement, for example, some serial port communication. Or uh, if you want to integrate with some native technologies like Java, uh, if you if you code uh, for uh, Android or Objective-C, if you do that for Apple products or or some uh, Win API or stuff like that, you wouldn't do that from uh, QML. Uh, so you would still need to use C++ for that. Uh, another reason is the fact that from C++, you have access to a wide range of, uh, of other C++ C libraries. Uh, that you may want to use, like, I don't know, OpenCV, OpenGL, like some algorithm and stuff, uh, you call it. Um, the performance, still, uh, the, there is a lot of uh, work 
uh, getting done to, to make QML uh, performing better, but still, if you do things right, you can uh, achieve better results uh, with C++. And the last reason to my mind is the fact uh, that if you keep UI stuff in QML and logic and other stuff in C++, then you have like a clear separation uh, of uh, b both those things. I mean, at least to my taste, uh, it's um, the way you should um, you, you should you should uh, code Qt applications. Yes, and um, um, that's how uh, some simple uh, Qt uh, object, some random object in QML may look like. And uh, if you want to use it somewhere else, you usually do that by accessing it by a name, by ID, uh, and, and properties or, or calling um, functions like that. Nothing, uh, nothing special. But this one was created in QML. What if you would like to do the same uh, with a C++ object? Well, firstly, it would need to be visible in KML. We'll talk about that uh, in a moment. Firstly, let's talk a, a bit about uh, so-called properties. So this is example of um, Q object derived class. I call it a production line. It's supposed to like visualize a production line in some factory, uh, whatever. Um, and uh, such a production line, it either operates and does the work or not. So uh, it has a, it has an operating boolean a member indicating whether the production line is working or not. So except uh, except uh, deriving from Q object and putting Q object macro here. I mean, I don't want to go into Q basics, but it's it's uh, uh, necessary. I mean, it's not necessary for properties. There is some other macro, but basically Qt has some thing called um, meta object compiler, which is basically another build step. Uh, and it goes over your code and it generates other C++ code that you don't see, which makes uh, Qt magic possible, like signals and slot and stuff. So you, you have that a member indicating whether the production line is oper um, operating or not. How to make it? visible in QML. You do that using a Q property uh, macro and here, oh yeah, here you specify the type, the name which will be uh, used for QML and here are, are the things that uh, are not uh, visible from, from uh, QML. You just need to uh, tell a Qt engine what functions are used to uh, do particular operations. So for example, to read the value, you are going to use this method. To set its value, you are going to use this. Notify, it's um, necessary to, um, to update uh, QML frontend in case in C++ this um, uh, variable will, will change. So um, yeah, and it points uh, to the signal here. Uh, so that's important that we have to emit the signal once the, uh, the value of operating has been changed. So that, those are properties. Um, we are talking about basics here in order to just I'll let you um, understand why the things that we will do later will work. Um, it's like a kind of a short course uh, uh, of the Qt basics. And uh, what you have to do uh, to make uh, the functions uh, visible in QML, you have two options. You can either put a Q invocable macro uh, ahead of uh, the uh, normal function um, uh, signature, or you could uh, put your method, your function, uh, below uh, public slots uh, keyword. But that would be all. And also um, the Qt engine uh, has own types and uh, the basic C++ types, and not all of them are basics because some of them are, are Qt ones, uh, are then uh, automatically converted to, uh, 
to what is understandable by QML engine. Uh, we don't have to stop here for a moment. The question is how to make QML uh, recognize your custom C++ uh, type or, or access C++ object. Uh, let's start with uh, accessing uh, C++ objects in QML. So is the situation in which you have uh, uh, some, uh, some uh, object already uh, instantiated in C++ and you just want to access it from QML for, for, for a single purpose. So I created uh, an example, it's like simple for QML frontend. And um, it's again, um, it's going to like visualize us at that production line. It has the uh, operating state that we can change uh, using the uh, using this script. And we have the counter uh, when the operating is on, then uh, I implemented some random generator that increases the, uh, the product's counter, but only when uh, this state is on. And this GIF here uh, is playing only the, if the production line is operating. How it looks in QML. So uh, to make uh, it more customized, I implemented my, my custom switch. And here you can see that as I set, uh, if the uh, switch checked uh, property changed, then I call on some, uh, for now, mysterious object. Um, I access its operating property and I set its value to be uh, whatever, uh, whatever was uh, checked. Here, I access product scan property to display this number here. And this, uh, this GIF here, it's playing depending on the operating property. So how to make uh, all of that possible? Let's take a look at the uh, class uh, declaration. So we have two properties. Uh, operating one, you already saw that, uh, and the product scan. Uh, notice that uh, it does not have all the keywords uh, as the previous one. Uh, that's because I can make um, a property read only. So in this case, I implemented a timer here, and uh, if the operating is on, it adds uh, it adds some uh, next product to, to this list, and uh, then product scan uh, returns the the length uh, of this list here. Uh, also, uh, when I add the product, uh, I have to call the the signal just just to update the value in QML. So uh, that's how I specify the properties. And then uh, that, that, that's, that's all I have done uh, extra except having, uh, ex except having uh, like the standard content. I, I just put those two macros here and I remember to, to call the signals. And then uh, in main CPP or just like in any place in uh, C++, I get access to QML's engine's context. Uh, I will talk about more about what's context uh, in a moment. And I call a method set context property. Here I provide a name under which uh, it's going to be visible in QML. And here uh, I specify a pointer to QObject uh, derived uh, class. Uh, yeah, and that's basically it. That's the name that you saw in QML. And thanks to that, I, I can access my uh, C++ uh, object in, uh, in QML. Uh, it works. It works fine. But I consider this uh, as more like a bad practice. Uh, you, especially in the past, you may have seen that quite often. Uh, but what's the problem with this approach? I, I mentioned to you that, 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 uh, that I'm going to talk about uh, what is context. So. Uh, Context uh, is uh, a, like a space uh, for all the uh, items and files opened uh, in, in QML. So uh, firstly, I have a root context, and then I load my main QML file. And 
but it consists of several other um, files. It opens other items. So each um, each file has its own uh, context. Uh, and uh, what's the problem with that? If I call set context property on root context, uh, then it's going to populate all of the contexts. So what's going to happen uh, if I would have um, some other QML item with the name production line uh, specified uh, specified uh, in, in a place like custom suite, but I, I use it somewhere else. Then we it's going to be ambiguous. So uh, I'm not using set context property. Instead, I use uh, a method called QML register singleton instance. Um, I mean, with that, we can uh, achieve more or less the same result. Uh, the, uh, you do that by, I mean, in, in main, for example, by doing the, uh, the same, you instantiate the, uh, the, the object. And here, the parameters are the, the following. First, you specify the name of the module um, that you have to import to see this particular object uh, in, uh, in in QML. <laughs> then um, some versioning numbers. Uh, they are now, uh, I mean, uh, with Qt6, they, they drop versioning, but uh, in this method, they are still there. Then there is, uh, I, I didn't check it uh, from, from, the, from the previous uh, presentation, uh, but it should say production line and it should uh, be uh, protection line here as well. That's basically the same way to do that. And then in QML, you import uh, that um, module that you specified uh, with this method, and then you can you can access the uh, the the object just like that. Um, yeah, that, that that that's how it works. Um, uh, so th that's that's why I uh, consider this uh, method better because then production line is recognized only in, in this file here. It's not recognized in the others, so it does not populate uh, all all the global context. Yeah, so that's how exposing works. Uh, there is uh, another way of. Uh, and making C++ and QML talking. And this is more advanced and broad stuff. And uh, we will like need uh, probably uh, like two days to, <laughs> to, to, to just uh, do a workshop about all the details of registering. So we will um, still talk about something basic. Registering is about making C++ classes behave the same as any other QML type uh, that you have seen so far. So, so like uh, like uh, all that buttons, uh, rectangles, mouse area, blah, blah, blah. How do you do that? Let's say that uh, now I have uh, two production lines. So, so what I would have to do uh, if I would, um, um, if I would still stick with exposing, uh, just like in the previous example. Then I would need to instantiate uh, like production line one, production line two, maybe more in C++, and I would generate a um, unnecessary boilerplate to expose each of them uh, uh, like, like for, for each uh, instance. So instead, we can uh, register a production line class as QML type and instantiate them directly in QML. That's one of the uh, cases for uh, registering. So uh, uh, I wrapped in QML uh, what you have seen. I mean, this column here with the text label, with the switch, with another text label and an image in a separated uh, file, a QML item called production block, and it has a property production uh, line. So you see that it's already C++ type that is uh, visible uh, in QML. Um, and uh, whenever 
for the needs of that column, I need a production line. I call root dot production line dot some property to access uh, its values. But how do I do that? Well, believe me or not, but all you have to do is to add this macro to the uh, to your class uh, declaration in a private section. And well, I lied because that's not all you have to do. You also need to go to CMake, uh, and uh, then for good applications, there are special um, uh, special commands, and one of them is Qt add QML module. Uh, it's uh, another broad topic uh, about QML modules and uh, organizing uh, QML applications. Um, yeah, so let's skip that. Let, ju let's just focus on the thing you see here. Instead of adding the C++ source files directly to, to a target, I add them to, to the module after the source's keyword, and Qt uh, does the rest. And, and, and thanks to that, you can uh, you can do it. So those are the two things that you have to uh, do to complete uh, this, um, to, to achieve this result, to have your C++ class visible uh, in, in, in QML. So just to remind, you have to add QML element macro, and you have to add it in the sources here. That's, that's, that's uh, yes? Is, is it then only visible in QML modules, which are in this um, CMake QML module, basically, in the class, or will it be visible inside the whole application? It's, go, it's going to be you, you, it's going to be visible uh, within the entire application. So so if you want still to access it uh, in your regular C++ code, yeah, you can still do that. Uh, you can uh, the, the modules they can also like import each other. So so uh, from from like C++ perspective only, uh, you can play with it. Um, but for example, if we have another module and it's going to have another class in QML, uh, so let's say let's say that we have this module and we add some other one, uh, and this other one also has uh, its um, custom C++ uh, types, then in this uh, module we will not see uh, the types from the other module until we import that module. Uh, yeah, so uh, regarding Qt add QML module, um, see my comment, uh, I had a presentation on Qt World Summit about that, uh, and uh, there's an example uh, on GitHub. We'll somehow share this presentation with you, I don't know how yet. Yeah, and then uh, in the, in the uh, my main QML, I have now two production blocks, uh, one for that uh, block on the left, so the, the other one uh, for the block on the right. And uh, you can see that I can instantiate my C++ class just like any other QML type here. It's not yet a visible type, we'll talk about that later, but in the syntax, everything is, is the same. Uh, just for the sake of, the, uh, of this example, uh, you can see that this one, I instantiated it just uh, as the child of the window. And, and then I assigned production block one, production line, uh, a property to point to this. Uh, but here for the, for the other uh, block, I specified it uh, just uh, in place. Um, also, uh, instead of a QML element or a macro or with QML element macro, you can use uh, uh, many other macros to achieve the other results. For example, you can go with QML uncreatable, just in a case, for example, let's say that you want uh, your C++ class to be passed as the um, um, parameter uh, of some function. So you intend, you intentionally don't want to make it possible to instantiate um, a class from uh, from QML because you just play with it uh, on C++, but you still want QML to recognize its uh, properties, 
to get access to the values and, and so on. So then you would go to we go with GML uncreatable. Um, and, and there are uh, other uh, macros here, uh, but I decided that uh, I'm, I just want to show you something other. And that other thing is drawing custom QML items from C++. Uh, man, uh, that's an uh, interesting one because uh, many C++ uh, projects, um, they, I mean, like the tool-like software for, uh, at Sage Studio, uh, at my company, we mostly work for medical companies and a lot of them, they play with OpenGL to, uh, to show some uh, medical structures to, to uh, show display some particular segments of uh, I don't know head or or whatever I'm not a doctor, um, or if you had like a CAD software, you 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 would like to uh, make it possible to display uh, what you already had in other technology. Let's say you implemented the same stuff with Qt widgets or just with some older technology, you can still port your OpenGL to uh, to, to QML, I'm going to show you how. Something is wrong with those dots here, but basically you have, uh, never mind. you have three options to draw uh, visible C++, um, uh, I, visible draw, again, you have like three options to draw uh, your QML uh, items, but from C++. The, the, the first one is using uh, a Qt Painter. It's like a high level uh, Qt um, API. Uh, it has a, a lot of features, uh, but it, um, it does not rely on OpenGL in the exact sense. And it's kind of expensive uh, from the hardware rendering uh, perspective. It rather uh, uses um, software rendering so so in some cases it can like use uh, a lot of um, cpu uh, and yeah but it's like the most popular and uh, and convenient uh, way uh, to draw uh, c++ qml items from c++ and then there are two other which i'm less familiar with uh, but uh, i still wanted to to, to show them uh, this one is quite uh, recent so let's go with the first one. Um, in Qt, everything uh, goes uh, around a class called QObject. Almost everything is QObject. Um, you have to remember that sometimes I'm simplifying, but let's, uh, for the sake of this uh, presentation, let's say that everything is QObject. And there is a class uh, called QQuickItem. Uh, it's the same class that uh, is instantiated, uh, that is used uh, in QML uh, as a base for all the, of the visual types. So let's say we have a, a mouse area, or we have a rectangle, or we have an image. All of them derive from QQuick item uh, because a QQuick item is basically transparent, but it provides all of the things that um, that you may need to to implement a UI, like like size of, of the item, position of the item, states, uh, visibility, opacity, all of that. And and there is Q Quick Painted item, which you may use. You, you may um, extend Q Quick Painted item in order to um, to draw uh, your a custom item with a cube painter api i'm going to show you an example right now so it's going to be a simple example and uh, let's say that i want to draw a star in my front end uh, qml does not have a type to draw a star so uh, i have to implement my own one uh, i have some options i could do it using a uh, canvas thing that is available in QML, but let's say that I want to do it in C++. What I do, I uh, define a class, I make it extend QQuick painted item, and you can see 
that it basically looks li like the previous uh, class. We have um, QObject macro. We use the property system uh, to make it possible to change the color of the star from QML. And we um, make it QML element in order to, um, um, to register it as QML type. And so then we can use it as, uh, as other QML types. And here we also do a thing. We override paint method. Uh, and I am going to show you the content of, of this method in a, in a moment. Yeah, so it's this. So I'm not going to uh, like to, to talk about uh, what, what's here. It's just drawing a star. But what you can notice here is that we use a, a, a property uh, that we expose to QML here. Um, so I'm just I'm, my goal here is to showcase how you can like um, make um, QML and C++ drawing um, parallelly. So I would have to remember that whenever the color is changed from QML, again this setter is exposed here i have to call update in order to like request a uh, redrawing yeah and that's how that's how my uh, star item is going to look like in qml um and i because i m i extend q quick painted item and so on uh, q quick item i have uh, with I have anchors, which are used for positioning, and I have my own uh, color property here. Uh, I recorded a GIF because I, I knew that something uh, will not work with my computer. So just to be safe and not go to IDE, I recorded a GIF. So you can see uh, this is uh, item um, and drawn in C++. I, I was changing the colors uh, and star was going to reflect this. And now I'm playing with the size and Q quick paint item uh, reflects the change, uh, requesting the, the up updates uh, all the time. So uh, that was a, a simple example. Um, let's now say that I want to let users interact with my, with my um, with my item, let's say, uh, to move it or, or to play with it in, in some sense. I, I can do that. I can implement behavior for that by overriding the blah, 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 event um, methods. Uh, uh, it's like, um, it does not bring anything to the presentation, so I'm not showing you uh, the content of, of those methods. But I'm just going to show you uh, another uh, example uh, of, uh, of a custom C++ uh, paint drawable class uh, registered as QML type. So um, I needed, uh, uh, we have been working on, on some project for post offices and they needed like on their software, they needed uh, that thing to, you know, like uh, leave your signature. So, so, so that, that, that was a proof of concept uh, for, 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 that, uh, for that thing. It was missing in, in KML, so I had to implement it from scratch. And that's how I did it. Here you see that uh, the uh, events that I, implement, that I added here uh, were indeed uh, reflected in the item that uh, uh, that user uh, draw. Yeah, and just to like those, uh, those were like kind of simple examples. Uh, this is like a real life example. Uh, we have been working on a medical project uh, for um, respirator, EKG stuff, and uh, cute tweak. Um, QML has a module called um, star, uh, but this module sucks, and there, there, 
I, I know because uh, Kit is open source and I have been contributing to this, this model. Um, and uh, it doesn't it doesn't have many features, um, including the feature that was needed. Uh, in this case, you see that this card is kind of rolling, right? So uh, it was uh, missing in third. Implement the same in two third. Uh, you would need um, you would need uh, to do some like crazy mumbo jumbo with buffers or, or so on. Um, and so we thought that it is better to draw our own from scratch. Especially uh, because uh, the cube cards they are not, let's say, uh, suitable for high frequency data. They coming from the sense of in, in, in this case. So uh, the uh, customer could not believe that uh, that uh, cube cards like like the official module uh, is not efficient at all. Uh, but anyway, we have to. Uh, Implement our own solution um, that was um, like additionally optimized. Yeah, so that's like the real life example uh, of the case in which you may uh, want to draw your uh, custom uh, object in C++. Yeah, and you have a question. You, you know that's uh, that the uh, I mean my my colleague uh, we did not have access to to the actual um, uh, device that was uh, taking the the parameters so for the sake of testing we like implement some kind of simulator that was taking the statistical data yeah, and you, you may be right <laughs> you, you may be right about that. Sorry, but I was not seeing who was talking. So uh, a colleague there said that we would not need to simulate that. We could use some existing data set. Uh, but we didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> So, going uh, going further, uh, it was uh, one of the uh, methods of uh, drawing um, UML items from C++. The another method would be by employing OpenGL to do that, and um, there are the uh, two ways of of doing that. Uh, here, I have to admit that I'm not uh, the expert in OpenGL. Uh, saying about Qt, I had the focus on other stuff. Uh, but anyway, I prepared uh, some uh, examples. So, examples by um, by the Qt, and uh, this is the example in which the OpenGL rendering was done before actual QML rendering was done. So, what you see here, I mean, this uh, rainbow colors thing, uh, it is uh, rendered before this thing here. Th this is uh, done in, in QML, and this is just below that. Uh, to do that, I, I need to like communicate uh, with the connect to uh, particular signals that are uh, emitted by a QQuick window. Uh, this, again, this e example, uh, is available uh, in uh, official Qt examples. Uh, basically, the, the, there is a GUI thread and QML scene graph thread. And, and you, you have to, um, like, uh, that's, that's how QML uh, renders frames. You have to either um, connect to before synchronizing and block the GUI for some time to scale the rendering of your e event, uh, of your object, or you can also do that after rendering. And there is the other uh, way. Uh, 
I think that it's a bit simpler because um, um, because you don't have to like play that much with the uh, with the um, signals coming from the place that you don't fully control. And but for that you would need to uh, have. Um, I'm going to show you. So. Uh, it's my custom OpenGL item, and it has to derive from QQuick frame buffer object. It has, it, it's like really dummy class. It has nothing special, uh, but it has to uh, have a, uh, have a method create a renderer that is going to uh, return a QQuick frame buffer object renderer, which does the actual job. Uh, and because of the abstraction, I can return my own one. So let's see how this uh, uh, own renderer uh, is uh, is implemented. Again, it's not even a Q object. All, all you have to do, uh, as long as you do some simple stuff, is to override render uh, method. Uh, here I draw, a, let's say, a diamond. You you see in a second. Uh, Qt uh, has Q OpenGL functions uh, classes, uh, which are basically the same as regular uh, OpenGL ones, uh, with some slight differences. Yeah, and that's that. That's the result. Uh, here is my uh, custom OpenGL item. Uh, it fills the entire window, puts there a black uh, background, and draws a, a diamond. And just to showcase, I uh, I draw uh, the ring uh, using some some uh, QML stuff. Yeah. So this is the the other way uh, of doing that. Uh, yeah. So just I'm here pointing. To the uh, to what I have uh, drawn uh, using QML and and C plus plus, and the last thing that is kind of recent, it's kind of new for Qt six. Qt six has like two three years. I don't remember exactly now. Uh, and uh, so before uh, QML was based mostly on OpenGL, but then. Microsoft decided that on Windows they would go with uh, uh, Direct 3D. Uh, on Apple there is Metal, so um, uh, there was kind of a problem with um, uh, making all of that uh, uh, working seamlessly. So Qt implemented uh, a cold called uh, Qt Rendering Hardware Interface, which is like kind of an abstraction layer. Quite low level one uh, to um, and uh, Q Qt Quick SyncGraph calls uh, API provided by rendering hardware interface uh, and RHI does the job uh, deciding on uh, the actual uh, rendering backend to use as long as it's supported on particular platform you can still use force it to use opengl if you want to uh, here the could is open source but the public api for rhi was uh, added uh, like with the latest minor uh, release which was like a few weeks ago uh, so uh, I, I didn't prepare the example for that, and it, it's so low, low level that I would not understand anything of that. So, to be totally honest, but uh, it's kind of a cool thing uh, for like the future projects. If you want uh, to like uh, make sure that uh, you are not limited at some point by uh, by OpenGL, for instance, or, or other rendering um, backend. So. Uh, I think that is going to be all uh, for those who don't uh, for those who don't uh, know Qt that well or QML that well. Uh, I just wanted to like uh, brag about the fact that I uh, recorded 16 episodes uh, a YouTube tutorial about uh, Qt 
um, it contains of uh, the stuff that Qt adds on top of C++. I made it all absurdly simple, so so everyone's going to uh, understand that. And then we forward uh, with um, with uh, uh, QML uh, learning. Um, actually, the the topic of uh, making C++ and QML talking is very, very broad and it's very complex. A lot of things come, of course, with experience. Uh, and there are things that I uh, could like extend or the things that I intentionally didn't even touch. And one of such things is model view programming. Uh, I think that uh, most of you heard about that. Um, it's also possible to uh, employ uh, C++ models um, in uh, for QML frontends, um, but it's so broad uh, that I, I I didn't even put it here. Uh, I could give you some more examples how uh, those other ways of registering C++ classes or enumerations or or, or other structures, for example. Uh, could be done using those macros. Uh, I could show you example of how C++ class is passed as a parameter in a function of some of some type. I could show you how to register uh, enumeration. And that's the thing that I will add to this presentation in the near future. Uh, but I have to like deep in, in this topic first. Yeah, so that's basically it. Uh, I would love to hear your questions. Is and now we have variation can be migrate to QML. I mean, is there some strategy here, some maybe tool? Um, how can we migrate existing code to QML? To digital code? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's okay. So I have to repeat the question. So uh, a colleague asked, uh, what would be the strategy to port existing uh, Qt widgets application to QML one? Yeah. Um, so uh, um, just like a couple uh, months ago, we finished uh, a project in which we had to like port uh, 12 years old Qt widget up to QML. And uh, uh, it went and it had all of the uh, OpenGL stuff and so on. And uh, we know the stuff. So for us, uh, it was uh, a, a challenge in sense of amount of work. Uh, but we at least had uh, knew how to do that. Uh, I would say that there are no serious obstacles uh, that you may face. Uh, it all depends on uh, how well your project is structured. With Qt widgets, we all have like a tendency to put uh, too much logic code uh, in UI widgets, La like, uh, um, like like the application flow and, and everything, or some more business logics in in the classes that like that end with widget dot cpp. Um, so so that may be the problem because then you would need to get rid of the, those classes. Uh, and to do it somewhere else. So I would say that, that it all depends of, uh, of, of your project, uh, how well it's like, if it's like a, done in modular way or, or not. Um, there is uh, a pattern called uh, ports and adapters, uh, yeah, ports and adapters, um, which is basically about making your, uh, code base ready for uh, for uh, any UI. Let's say that you have uh, some communication method uh, and now you need to communicate over MQTT, uh, but at some point you are going to uh, communicate over some other protocol. So so with this design pattern, it helps you to, um, to make your uh, project ready for such, uh, for such case. But uh, yeah, it's totally possible. 
But as men earlier, you're right. And that is not, not the way. Say again? For example, the cute widget. I have a big, a complicated screen with a lot of buttons, a lot of other elements, cute widget elements. And to move it to command, I have simply manually rewrite. There is no magic automated <laughs> tool. I just want to simplify my life. <laughs> Wait a second. Uh, no, there is not such a, uh, such a tool. Uh, well, uh, ther theoretically, um, there uh, there is a thing which is open source and it's not fully maintained, which is called uh, declarative widgets, which uh, basically lets you run your widget applications and code them using QML, uh, but there are still widgets applications. They, they look the same. Uh, they be behave the same. You have the, the similar problems with the customizations. So yeah, you would need to to write in write it from uh, from the scratch because like for the UI purpose, the both uh, approaches, Qt widgets one and Qt week are uh, fundamentally different, right? Yes. Sir. Yes. And last question. Let, 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 let him finish. Yeah, I think one question from the student. Could you criticize Kremel? What is wrong with this? Maybe, maybe, maybe let's. Uh, if uh, if you have the answer to that question and, if, and you want to, uh, like, uh, go with the topic, uh, let, let's hear you. Yeah, and then I will. A, a, a uh, basically, right? You could have a QT widget here in QML, so you still have a, a page which consists out of QT widgets, but they're embedded inside QML, basically. So the whole view, basically, you, you make a could you create item out of, or then have a, so there was some possibility and vice versa, right? So you don't have to port your whole application at once. And it might be that you have some task which never changes, which you don't need to touch, so, so you don't need to port. Okay. Yeah, and uh, just like you said, uh, and vice versa. So uh, if you want to start small, you can like choose some widget, some part of the screen uh, that you want to rewrite to uh, to QML. And there is a Q, quick, uh, widget uh, class uh, that basically lets you put QML in in, in, a, in a widget uh, embed like, like embed QML in, in widget uh, item and, and then you lie out that widget in, in the same way you do that with the other widgets but inside that widget you can have uh, a QML code but uh, but here the the problem is let's say that you want QML to Overlie some other part of the screen, and then you may have problem. To my, uh, you know, guys, to be totally honest, um, I, I I wanted to prepare that example for Qt RHI, that that the the last uh, API that I was talking about, and I asked uh, ChatGPT to prepare me one, and he made it up. He made it up. There was there was uh, no classes like that. He totally made it up. I, I, I you know I I like uh, copied and pasted that uh, into my ID and I was like, oh, class is not recognized. And yeah, because there was no class like that. The question is whether we would have realized that uh, ChatGPT made it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it was a fresh thing for me, so I was like, Q frame. Q, LHI, frame buffer, yeah, sounds reasonable. <laughs> uh, so uh, to, um, to um, a, co a colleague uh, also asked uh, the other question, which was uh, uh, the uh, disadvantages of QML. Uh, well, of course, uh, I can. I mean, um, uh, I think that um, it has a great tendency to become spaghetti code really really fast i i, I mean uh, if you um, if you don't have experience with qml if you uh, don't follow the uh, some code conversions guidelines best practices it can get messy and not usable very fast you just uh, open some file a, a month later and and you wonder who wrote this and it was you um, so so yeah i think that it's going to be the um, the uh, biggest um, disadvantage of, of QML. 
Um, also, um, uh, on, <laughs> recently I had like several talks and uh, one guy asked me about my uh, biggest uh, disappointment uh, with uh, Qt and QML. Uh, and um, it was um, some years ago, I didn't have a company back there. And uh, I joined a, a project. There was some uh, legacy Qt widgets application. And I had more uh, experience with um, QML. And I have been asked to implement some new dialogue window with the new uh, UI and stuff. Uh, and for me, it was uh, more comfortable to do that with QML. Uh, so um, I implemented a Q quick window, which behaved like, like a dialogue. And it had like a semi-transparent black um, background covering entire uh, application and, and that dialogue in the middle. And yeah, and it was uh, working and looking fine. So we added it to the release. And um, some weeks after, we have we started to get um, a bug reports uh, that application is not um, uh, responsible. And um, that was because uh, on the platforms with no hardware acceleration, QML requires hardware acceler acceleration, my uh, QML item uh, was not rendered. So it was basically a Q quick window uh, or Q quick widget. Now I don't remember. Class was there. It was covering entire window, making it uh, making it impossible to click anything. So so users thought that that, that the the app was not responsible. Uh, yeah, and uh, what was the the solution for that? Uh, <coughs> The reason was that um, in case of this application, it was application used by like thousands of uh, thousands of users, uh, and some of them they had they they had like huge organizations which provided virtual machines with no hardware acceleration. So so th so, th so that was the reason, uh, and I put some a uh, uh, some kind of alternative for software rendering, but then it was laggy and it was not working. Uh, well, so 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 that was the the other uh, that was the other uh, disadvantage of, uh, of QML. But it's not a, a a thing for for many other projects, right? Um, I mean, uh, if you if you want to have like fancy UI, uh, then then you need some kind of a platform that uh, supports uh, hardware rendering. Yes. Yeah, we have a problem, some problem with uh, QML that uh, the layout stuff is, it feels very like hard coded and magic numbery. So like when a colleague says me, hey, I, I fixed the layout issue, now the, the button is on the right place. I look at the pull request and it says, okay, the anchoring point was switched from 17 to 15. And <laughs> I have no idea what this means. Is this good or is this bad? And uh, I think, and um, with the, uh, Things like uh, yeah, centering stuff or balancing elements in, in the layout is uh, okay. So 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 so, so yeah. Uh, um, just for our uh, remote viewers, uh, the the problem raised here is that uh, QML sometimes and uh, I can confirm that uh, does not uh, work uh, that well. Um, with uh, the UIs that have to uh, adjust to, to many screen resolutions or the window size or or, or, or so on. Yeah, and that's true. Uh, uh, anchors are better uh, if you do, um, let's say, small margins or you have like a fixed size uh, window for, uh, for just one, um, Machine model and it's not going to it's not going to change, but in case of uh, mobile or uh, desktop applications, the screen it can be 4K. It can it, in Windows you can change um, uh, DPI. Um, um, uh, you can scale the window. You can like uh, make your uh, monitor like in a portrait mode. There are a lot of things that you can do. 
so uh, in in such case, I would say that simply uh, there are better solutions than anchors, and those are uh, layouts uh, with like setting minimum uh, or preferred size and so on. Uh, yeah, yes, but uh, it requires some kind of a skill uh, because there are se several uh, like uh, concepts for positioning. Uh, those are layouts, anchors, X and Y and Z properties. Uh, there are uh, so-called position positioners like row, grid. There is grid layout. There is grid. There are there are many many other ways uh, to to implement the same, and they are applicable. They are applicable applicable in different scenarios. And uh, Andreas? Sure. Um, can you go back to the question with, uh, sorry, to the slide with the uh, OpenGL sample code? Yeah. So this renderer gets now instantiated once for uh, every instance of the uh, of the widget or once for every like type of widget so it's shared across all the instances how does it work i don't know don't uh, no i don't know i i, I mentioned uh, to you um, before talking about like the painting that i, I like stop on q painter mostly I see. Okay. the the open gl and stuff it's uh, like uh, I n not actively uh, c coding and uh, I didn't develop myself into OpenGL direction uh, and I will probably never do. Okay, well, that's, that's fine. It's just that like, this, this approach seemed not very efficient to me to do it with OpenGL. But then if, if you didn't look at it too much. Uh, like not efficient because of uh, because of what? Um, because you're like, because you're recreating uh, the shaders for uh, for every drawing. Uh, to be to be fair, there, there are also methods to uh, yeah. I, I could keep them. I mean, um, it's just a, a just a dummy method. I could like save them in the um, as the as the members or or just whatever I would. It's just a dummy yeah, example. Right. Right? So, like in particular, if you're drawing like. A, like a thousand of, of these widgets, right, on, on the same screen. I, I would repeat everything would over want, and over. Exactly. And like, you would not even want to rebind the shader, right? You want to keep like the pipeline exactly the same and just like... Uh, change small things. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, this render is called on every day. Like in every time that you would precise or something, like you would call this render. Yeah. But, but yeah. like, yes, it would be inefficient to... Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then, but if, if it's just example code, then then I'm fine. <laughs> Don't do it like Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, in your experience, how hard is it to work with this model view with QMLs when you have like a deep hierarchy of uh, QML um, objects, and it's not like a flat? I have one you, of each. You mean you mean like with the tree view? Um, non not necessarily a tree view, but you have let's say you have a complex. UI, not like a simple flat UI, when you have to inject the model into these specific um, QML objects, what would, you, what would be the approach that is? Uh, but OK, but just to better uh, understand the essence of the question, uh, like, what do you mean by no complex uh, UI? So if you have a complex UI, Let's say 20 widgets, 20 objects, 20 widgets, and they're deep nest, nested widgets, one inside the other, because of the layout. And you, you have to pass around this model for the UI to render the values correctly. Um, what would be the approach in QML? Um, you have some example with the uh, injection of the um, object in the. Um, in the root node, and you also put the example of creating the object inside. Um, ah, okay. So, so, but in this case, the object itself had the model. Uh, 
how would you use an external model that you have somewhere for your front end? Um, I, I would say that it, um, I mean, in the modern Qt projects, uh, there is almost no exposing. Uh, so, uh, so uh, usually you instantiate uh, everything uh, in QML. If it's something that is important for the project uh, or it's um, it lives as long as um, as entire application lives, so you can do that in main QML. After all, let's say that you have uh, some class instantiated in QML. It can have all members instantiate inside, so it, it does not really matter. Uh, uh, your question is, I, I, I would say that if you have like that um, UI with many layers and and uh, and here is main and you go there, 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 and you have some some page with, with the need to get access to, to something that is uh, specified here, I, I would say, um, Either go with uh, uh, with singleton. You can instantiate something as, as a singleton, or probably better, um, uh, you could uh, pass it as the property through. You pass it uh, through the hierarchy. Uh, for instance, yes. Okay, so. Uh, uh, <coughs> I would, uh, you can ask me about an, anything uh, related to also like my opinions about Qt or, or, or whatever, in case you don't have any other questions. Yes? Are the slides somewhere available? Tomorrow is Qt World Summit. I have to drive to Berlin. Uh, and be there at nine, uh, but with Lucas, we will somehow feel, we will think about the way to share it with you. Uh, I don't know, guys, what is your preferred way to share the slides? I just uh, we can edit the meetup description, like add a comment, we will add it. Good yeah, well, you, you, you have it, it's not my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> so, when you send us the slides, we can distribute. Okay, okay, sure. Uh, yeah, um, I had 45 minutes here. Uh, uh, if I would, uh, if I would have more time, I would go deeper in, in those topics. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's the broad topic. Uh, if you need any help with the Qt QML project, let, let me know. Question? Okay. Yes. Uh, I have a question about competing technologies. Like you, at the beginning, you mentioned um, mobile frameworks like uh, Ionic, Ladder, but what about HTML? Like there are a few projects that uh, use HTML for front end and like Towery, for example. And the back end, they uh, run uh, Rust. So let uh, web developers do uh, user interface and let C++ developers do business logic. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, well, um, I, I would not uh, like um, uh, focus on the technologies that, that you uh, mentioned because it does not really matter. Uh, uh, we often work on projects uh, which are uh, around so-called uh, HMI interfaces. So whenever there is a, a screen on the machine and, and it's touchable and you need uh, to make a user uh, communicate with that machine, you put there a screen and it's often called uh, HMI, human machine interface. Uh, and um, there are a lot of machines like that. There are ATMs, uh, there are those uh, in car, in vehicle infotainment in new modern fencing cars. Uh, uh, they put that on medical stuff and on some uh, other projects. Uh, basically, everything gets a, a screen now. Uh, and I have been talking with many producers of such stuff, and they often use uh, other technologies, including uh, Microsoft ones, uh, and including the web ones for the framework, uh, for the front end. Uh, yeah, and basically the problem here is, is the manpower. I, I mean, if we would uh, go uh, into 
uh, like comparing uh, both approaches, um, usually I would find a cute, better, richer uh, framework for GUI programming. Um, but uh, there are also business cases. Sometimes like fancy graphical effects are not needed, right? Uh, it would be enough to just show some buttons. It, it does not have to be that performant. Uh, we have a guy that knows Angular. Uh, let's put Chromium uh, on our screen and he's going to, to do that. I mean, it's nothing uh, like I have the influence on. It's, it all depends uh, like on, on the strategic choices uh yeah yeah i would say so uh rust uh, rust is the interesting topic uh keydape uh, my competitors they i like them a lot uh, they develop uh bindings uh, of cute to rust so that's a thing and there is also a framework that i'm that i observe uh, quite uh, closely which is called slint uh and it's like almost UI programming is identical to QML UI programming, I would say. And some guy even responsible for QML left cute company to join them. Uh, yeah, and you could see it. And it's, it's fancy. It still misses a lot of things, but it's something that uh, I have my eye on. Uh, okay. Okay, so guys, thanks uh, a lot. I'm, I'm super happy that I could be here. And you have... Uh, the best C++ user groups uh, uh, I have seen so far. <laughs>